Good morning, church. My name is Audrey Cavill. I'm the director of Children's Ministry and Faith Development here at First United Methodist Church, and I'm so glad to see you here in person and online. Hello, hello. Whoa, did you just see that? I, th I think it was a, a gingerbread man. Ha ha ha! Hee hee hee! I'm the gingerbread missions man. Wee! What? You might be thinking, where am I? Yes, today is our missions fair, and I suspect that that gingerbread man is probably going to be hiding downstairs after worship. Would anyone here be willing to help me look for the gingerbread man? Anybody? Good Not just luck. kids. <laughs> Not just kids, adults too. Mm hmm. Come on, everybody. Today, after worship, head downstairs to our missions fair where you get to learn about many, many dif different missions here at First United Methodist Church while we also have a gingerbread house decorating contest. See, it all makes sense now, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So I'll see you after worship downstairs. Christmas Eve traditions continue here at first, including the beautiful candlelight liturgical dance to O Holy Night. Interested kids and youth in grades 5 through college should sign up to dance on Church Center, and the single rehearsal is next Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Do you enjoy spreading Christmas cheer? Then you are invited to join the Methodist Connection for Christmas Caroling on Saturday, December 16 at 3 p.m. We will meet at First Community AME on the corner of James and Logan to carol and conclude with a light meal. Next Sunday after worship, you're invited to a time of holy play. Meet us in the upper room for cookies, games, and photos by the Christmas tree. Photos will be emailed to you to use however you'd like. You'll also have the option to have us upload that picture onto Church Center. It's only 14 days until Christmas Eve, Yikes. and there is a lot going on at First Church on that day. From 8 to 10 a.m., we will host our annual Casey's Breakfast for our Heartside neighbors downstairs in Wesley Hall, and we still need a few more Casey's socks which are due next Sunday. At 10 a.m. that day, join us for worship in the sanctuary to celebrate the fourth Sunday of Advent. There will be no community hour activities that day. We hope you'll go home and take a Christmas Eve nap. Then at four, our family storytelling service invites children to help tell the story of Jesus' birth. And finally, at 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve, we'll welcome the Christmas season with our traditional candlelight and communion worship service. We anticipate many visitors at both services and we need a few more greeters at both um, to sign up for that opportunity or for any of those that I mentioned. Please head to our website grfumc.org slash news or log in to the Church Center app. To financially support the many ministries of First Church Place your offering in one of the offering stations or go online to grfumc.org slash give. Your gifts enable valuable ministry and mission work in our community and beyond. And now it's time for the noisy coffee can offering, which benefits the Cuba feeding program this month. If you're joining us online or forgot your change, head to grfumc.org slash give to support the coffee can offering or the many ministries of First Church. People on my left here, let's start passing those cans and don't forget to give them a noisy shake.
Good morning, God's beloved. Will you please join me in the call to worship? God of love, we yearn for your presence. Our hearts ache for your light. Christ, bearer of miracles, we look to your coming for the dawning of your new day. We look for the light that leads us to life. Spirit of light, arise in us and guide us. Our hearts are open mangers, ready for the birth of the Holy Child in our love and hope and gentleness. Come, O light, and dawn upon us. Come, O light, and unfold your beauty within us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Great God, loving mystery, as your angel Gabriel came to Mary, come to us now and speak to us. May your Holy Spirit come upon us and the power of your love overwhelm us so that what is 
is in our hearts may be holy. Conceive in us your love, your grace, your breathing presence. We are in your service. May it be for us according to your word. In the name of the Christ, who is coming and who is always with us, we pray the words he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. This Advent time, we remember Mary and Elizabeth giving thanks for their faithfulness, courage, and obedience. Stepping out into the unknown in the strength of God's Spirit, playing their part in fulfillment of God's plan to bring your people home again. May their example be the pattern of our lives. <coughs> that when God's gentle whisper breaks through the noise of this world and into our small corner, may we be ready to listen. And having listened, to act. Hear now the scriptures as they come to us from the Gospel of Luke, Mary's song of praise. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the loneliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God.
I want to invite the girls and boys to come up front and join us for our time with the children and lighting of the Advent wreath. shining faces that we have here on a Sunday morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think we can do better than that, right? We're awake. We're at church. It's Sunday. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So good to see you all here today. Today is uh, a special day because we're how many weeks away from Christmas Eve now? 14 weeks? <laughs> 14 days, that's right. Yeah, 14 days or two weeks. It's going to be Christmas Eve, so we're getting very excited for that. And that's uh, part of the build, uh, buildup of that excitement is what we're doing here today as we're going to open up another present to help build our manger scene that is right over here. And we're going to light two candles on this Advent wreath. Last week, we lit the first candle, which is the candle of hope. And that reminds us that Jesus is the hope of our world. Today, we're going to light that candle, and we're also going to light the second blue candle, and that is the candle of peace. And when we talk about peace, sometimes we refer to that in, um, well, either the fact that we're fighting or we're not. But peace is more than just about whether we're fighting or not. There's ways that we can have peace in our own hearts and we can have peace in our own minds. What are some things that you really uh, feel uh, that you like that brings you peace? Is there anything that you can say, this brings me peace? Maybe sometimes it's being with family. Maybe sometimes it's being with your friends. Maybe, it, hopefully, sometimes it's being here at church, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Enthusiasm, I tell you, that's great. But either way, uh, we're reminded that when Jesus comes, one of the uh, things that we call him is the Prince of Peace. And so that's why we're going to light this candle today, even as we pray for peace in the place where Jesus was actually born, in, uh, in Jerusalem uh, and in Bethlehem. We know that there is actually some fighting going on there. So we want to pray for peace, even as we're preparing to welcome Jesus to the Prince of Peace. And the other thing we're going to do to help build our manger scene is we're going to open another present and put our characters up there. So as we get ready, like last week, we put up some of the animals there that uh, we'd find in the manger, but we've got some other characters in that Bible story when Jesus was born that also are going to go up there this week. So who do you think might be in our present this week that we're going to open up? Who do you think it might be? The three wise men? Well... That's close, but not quite. You see, the, the three wise men are going to come actually a little later on, after Jesus is born, too. Who do you think? Jesus? That's a good guess. The right answer is always Jesus, right? Yeah, not quite, but in, remember we talked about in two weeks, 14 days, we're going to be uh, welcoming Jesus in there. What do you think? More animals? Well, yeah, there could be. There could be some animals in here. Let me see. You know what? You're right. There are a couple of more animals in here because we had some sheep that did wander off. So you're right. I can get you a sheep right there. And here. would you like a sheep? No, you don't want a sheep? Okay, we'll hand out a couple more sheep. You want a sheep? There you go. One more sheep there that we got to go. But there's some other folks that are in here still that take care of the sheep. Who, the, who might that be? Is that what you were going to say? No. <laughs> no, it's not Jesus' parents, but I heard someone else say it there. We have shepherds to wrangle all those sheep, as a matter of fact. Now, who didn't have a chance last week to put one up? Let's, uh, let's go over here. You weren't even here last week. Oh, my goodness. Well, the nice thing is we got two more weeks, and I need two more volunteers as if I'm going to struggle with that. Okay, let's have one here and one here to help us light 
our two candles on the Advent wreath. Now, before we do that, Audrey's going to give us some instructions after we finish up here of what we're supposed to do. So go ahead, Audrey, and tell everybody where we're going Friends, after that. If you are in preschool all the way through second grade and would like to come to Children on Worship, when we're done here, we're going to go out that door, up the ramp, and through the double wood doors to Children in Worship. And kids in fourth, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade are welcome to join the Wesley Singers. And after worship, there's no community hour small groups because we're heading downstairs for the mission fair and the gingerbread contest, okay? Okay. That's great. So we're going to go up and put our shepherds and our uh, wandering sheep back up on into the uh, manger scene. And then my candle lighters are going to join me here and we'll light those two candles. And congregation, we need your help. So join us in singing those first two verses and the chorus of the Advent song. All right, let's go do this.
Well, good morning again, church. It's good to be with you as we celebrate this second Sunday of Advent, and I just got to say, in all my years of uh, doing this, when um, we light the wreath and we uh, open this week's presents, you just never get the shepherd. So, you know, <laughs> hopefully you picked it up, but uh, we'll try again next week. As we are uh, continuing in our Advent series on recovering joy, I want to invite us to hear again from the Gospel of Luke from the first chapter, verses 26 through 28, or 38, excuse me. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a young woman engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, Well, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of God for all of God's people. Amen. Thanks be to God. Well, as our uh, kids also pointed out uh, during our children's time, it is only 14 days or two weeks, if you will, for the rest of us uh, until Christmas Eve. And uh, that means... We only really have about 13 more shopping days, uh, just so you're all aware of that as well. So that will be a perfect time to visit downstairs for our mission fair and build a gingerbread house and consider how your gift can support all these ministries here at First Church. There, that's the end of my shameless plug. But it seems that we always tend to talk about things now in terms of our consumerism. Only 13 more shopping days. Santa is watching. Only so many four days left until we can do something before it's too late. Too late for what? Well, I don't know about you, but between my family and my extended family and my in-laws, Christmas is not a day. It's about a week-long process where we celebrate at least two or sometimes three Christmases throughout the week usually. Anybody else do the same out there? Yeah, some hands go up. But our culture has turned the lead up to Christmas and the day itself as the culmination of something rather than a time to begin celebrating. It's actually a time for us to share and to take our time to understand the meaning of the birth of Christ, not as something that is all over with, but about a new beginning that we are being called to live into in this season of Advent. We've taken this time, centered it around a consumerist type of culture, and we can oftentimes then misunderstand what it is that we're doing. And that's not uncommon for us anymore. But it didn't always used to be that way, and in fact, it's been a relatively short time since it has been this way. In my time working at uh, Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan as a young college student and graduate, 
seems like somewhat of a lifetime ago, but not too far. This time of year was always celebrated in the village as a uh, holiday festival celebration. But the customs and the things that we did in those historic uh, buildings always took a lot of explaining to people because they didn't understand it. Among other things, I played a Christmas tree salesman from the early 1900s right next to the Wright Brothers Cycle Shop. Visitors to the village in the week between Christmas and New Year's would often be surprised to find that the area was still being served, if you will, and there I was as a role player still trying to sell somebody a Christmas tree. People would say, well, Christmas is over. And so we would have to explain to them that it's only very recently in the 20th century that decorations were done the way that they are now. Some of you might even probably get rid of your tree or take it down a day or two after Christmas. But then most people put their trees up on Christmas Eve and would continue the celebration through Epiphany Sunday or January 6th. And more so, people who were poorer, they would buy their trees after Christmas at a lower rate, so they would put them up in their home at at least some point during the 12 days of Christmas. But see, our culture has shifted. It's changed over a relatively short period of time when it comes to how we celebrate, and we often misunderstand and we reinterpret our past practices as something that we have just always done just like putting up your Christmas trees early and taking them down immediately afterwards. It's relatively new, and in some ways exactly the opposite way of how our cultures for centuries before used to do it. What we have come to believe to be true may not have always been true, and it's helpful for us to understand where we're coming from. As we examine what it means to recover joy in this Advent season, I believe that we in some way need to regain an understanding of what the birth of Christ means for us in the 21st century. Between presents and decorations and parties, we can get lost and we can misunderstand the true meaning of joy that God has given us in Jesus, all because we are fulfilling some other obligation that we feel we have to do. See, this morning we read a story, the story of the Annunciation to Mary and her response. In that response, we can see that even she was having trouble understanding what was really going on. She was perplexed, as the scripture says, or confused, wondering what kind of announcement this might be. And when Gabriel reveals to her what is about to happen, She's even more confused and questions, well, how can this be? Not only was Mary's perspective of what it meant to be favored by God different or not understood, her perspective of what a Messiah, or in this case, the Messiah, might actually be and how they might arrive. In fact, Mary's misunderstanding is something that I believe all of us misunderstand from time to time. And the way we celebrate doesn't make it any easier. Now, I remember having a discussion with some old college friends of mine, uh, some of whom were, who were Jewish, as we were discussing what the university should do about making a push to excuse students for the Jewish holidays of Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. And we began discussing their significance to, in my case, be educated about how important these days were. Well, another well-meaning friend said in the midst of this discussion, well, what about Hanukkah? Isn't that important too? To which our Jewish friend replied back with this kind of uh, patronizing look of, poor soul, you don't understand. He said, look, the only reason that Hanukkah is acknowledged like it is is because it comes so close to your most important holiday. 
Now, of course, then being the well-learned biblical scholar that I was, I stepped in and said, well, technically speaking, Easter is the most important holiday in Christianity. Shocked, he looked back at me and said, really? His death is more important than the birth? So I responded, well, it's not just death, but resurrection. But yes, that's most important because it's what makes Jesus who he is for us. And his response was, well, that seems pretty dark and dim. <laughs> then he goes, went on to say, but you wouldn't know that was the case, about Easter that is, because of the way we celebrate. Now, all of us had to learn something that day, and I confess that today I'm even still learning, and hopefully we all are. As I have been in ministry now over the years, that conversation, along with my own experiences, has caused me to rethink a few things. I've come to understand why we celebrate and the significance of our holy days a lot differently than I did in my previous textbook theology about our holy times. Not to diminish any one over the other, but I have come to love Christmas not just because of the cultural celebration, but I understand now that Christmas is equally important, if not maybe sometimes more important, at least for me. I know, label me a heretic if you wish. It won't be the first time that anybody said that either. But the reason that it has become at least equally important is about the joy that we can and we must share with the world that so often misunderstands Christianity, misunderstands Jesus, and misunderstands the church. Now, the church has oftentimes helped in that misunderstanding. Don't get me wrong. But we have an obligation then to communicate that joy that comes with God incarnate. The angel tells Mary that there is great joy. When Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, Elizabeth tells her that the child in her womb leapt for joy at the sound of her voice. The shepherds are told at his birth that there is good news of great joy for all the people. The incarnation is important and should not be understood as a means to an end, but an answer to a world that in the midst of sorrow and pain and lacking joy, God is entering directly into this world and God has sent God's own son and that is good news of great joy for all of us. And that is something that we can and we should recover, not only for us, but for the world to experience that joy. Now that's not to say that joy comes easily. In fact, sometimes we do have to work at recovering this joy because Christmas can be busy and it can be hard. So we must ponder in our own hearts just as Mary ponders in her heart what it means for us and how we can be those instruments of joy even as we receive joy in our own. Advent and Christmas is not just about the gifts that we have to give to others, but first and foremost, it is about God's gift that is given to us. And it's a gift that actually keeps on giving, to use the cliche, and it will continue to give if we allow that joy to enter our hearts, and especially allow that in this time of year, but carry that joy over into all times of year. And the thing about recovering joy is that it doesn't have to be something elaborate, but it does need to be something that you enjoy. What brings us hope? What brings us peace? That is also the misunderstood message of our time. All I need to do is look at our neighbors and their professionally installed, fully symmetrical Christmas light displays or the ones who have coordinated lights with a radio station that you can tune in for the music to go with it and think, well, I can't do that, or that's way too much and over the top. But that's not what our joy is all about. 
The lights, no matter how they look, the decorations, no matter what they look like or how full or sparse they are, are simply a reflection of the joy that we are sharing in the coming of Christ. And in that sharing of joy is what we find most important, however you are able to share it. I learned actually just a, a, a few weeks ago that last year, 2022, was the 30th anniversary of the Muppet Christmas Carol. Anybody a fan of that? Anybody seen that? Yeah, look at all those hands. Yeah, good. Good to see the grown-ups watching the Muppets. That's good. <laughs> now, for me growing up, the Muppet Show was much-watched TV back then, and I've appreciated the movies and the other shows they've done to a lesser extent. But for the 30th anniversary, actor Brett Goldstein, who plays the character Roy Kent in the Ted Lasso series, considers himself the world's greatest Muppets aficionado. And in fact, I uh, came across it on YouTube that last year he conducted an interview with all of the Muppet characters for a 30th anniversary of the Muppet Christmas Carol, in which he interviewed Kermit and Miss Piggy and, uh, and Fozzie in their characters, of course. And in general, when Goldstein was asked why he loves the Muppets so much, he says this. The secret of the Muppets is they're not very good at what they do. Kermit is not a great host. Fozzie is not a good comedian, as Statler and Waldorf remind him all the time. Miss Piggy is not a great singer. Like, none of them are actually good at it. But they freaking love it. <laughs> and they're like a family. And they like putting on the show. And they have joy. And because of that joy, it doesn't matter what they're good at or not good at. And that's like what we should all be. Muppets. Doing what we love and having joy in it. As we have heard from our scriptures today, and the Gospel of Jim Henson as well, but as we have heard from our scriptures today, from the perspective of Mary, there are things that she does not understand. And as she tries to find meaning in understanding of what is happening there, ultimately, what we realize, just like all of us, is we go time through times of doubt. We go through times of uncertainty, and we cannot feel the joy in our present circumstances. Many of us feel this way. <clears throat> but just like, as the song says, the same breath from heaven that blew over creation and gave life to all of us and all of this world, that same breath of heaven speaks to Mary, and that same breath or spirit <clears throat> can speak to us today. It is God's promise that Jesus will be the good news in great joy and that Jesus will light our path. As we continue to recover joy in these coming weeks, let's approach them with a new understanding. That this is good news of great joy for all of the people and that Advent and Christmas tell us that God is with us and Christ not only is coming, but has come and will come again. And the Spirit of God continually surrounds us. Not just in these weeks leading up, not just on December 25th or January 6th, if you want to extend it out there, but all throughout time. God can. God will. And God is giving us new life and giving us new joy that we can share with all of the world. So let's go out and share that joy as we prepare to welcome and celebrate Jesus again. Amen. <laughs>
the response in today's prayer is come Lord Jesus hear our prayer God of peace be with us on this Advent journey be with us in our worship and in this prayer that we share together Lord, in this holy season, when every heart is invited to be happy and light, there are those among us who struggle with the heaviness of life, with the burdens that can disrupt our joy. We live in disturbing days. a world that can be filled with conflict and inequality. Make this time of waiting a time of new awakening of compassion and mercy and justice by all leaders and all nations to bring about health and peace and freedom and understanding. Come, Lord Jesus, hear our prayer. Almighty and merciful God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, understood people's fear and pain, have mercy on those in need, for the hungry and the homeless, for those in refugee camps, in hospitals and nursing homes, for those who are cared for in their homes. Bless those who work to bring them relief. Inspire in us generosity and compassion. Come, Lord Jesus, hear our prayer. We pray for all those we know and love, those who are unwell and those who need comfort and strength. We pray you surround all those who mourn with your continuing compassion. We pray for our government, all governments and those in authority, and we pray for our churches, as we all struggle to seek to do what is right in difficult times. We lift up the suffering people of Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, and those around the globe living in war zone whose well-being is threatened and torn apart whose way of life is destroyed by hatred and fear and greed. Come, Lord Jesus, hear our prayer. God of hope, who brought love into this world, be the peace that dwells between us. Be the joy that dwells within us. Be the rock we stand upon. Be the center and the focus of our lives this Advent season and always. Amen.
This Advent, let us go out and be light and peace in the darkness and the shadows of this world. Let us bring joy to those who have no hope. Let us bring peace to those who have no peace. And let us bear the good news of great joy that is found in all of us through the power of the Holy Spirit that is revealed in the coming of Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.